Hey, good morning. This is Andy from Two Gray Beards. And as you can see, I'm taking my beard situation a bit too seriously and need a haircut. But that's not going to keep me from doing a new Two Gray Beards explainer. The topic today is the various programs that the U.S. government, the Fed, the FDIC have enacted and may enact to stabilize the situation in the banking system and its implications on the real economy, banks, and securities prices. So let's start out with what's happening. And I think the first thing that we need to talk about is why did banks have a deposit run? And firstly, a deposit run is someone wanting to get their money out of a bank and transfer it to another bank or out of the system entirely via physical cash, which isn't what we're talking about here, or a transfer to a money market fund or some other vehicle for their cash. And people do that all the time. They move money out of accounts and banks handle it. When all uh, depositors try to take money out at once, that creates a problem. The runs that we've seen in history are usually due to the idea that either a depositor needs their money because they have obligations that have fallen due, like for instance, during the crash of 1929, many investors lost a bunch of money and had to pay off margin. And so they had to dip into their bank account, creating a deposit run. But also, and this is the bigger deal, it's when the security and soundness of the bank itself is questioned. Um, and that can happen for a variety of reasons. But usually it happens for two possible reasons. The first is very important, and that is that the bank, for whatever reason, has uh, significant losses um, on its assets, either suddenly or over time, which means that the depositors may not have enough assets that they are using to secure their deposit in order to pay off all depositors, and then the first one out is the winner. And that's what we saw in Silicon Valley Bank. Another run is simply a liquidity run in which there's an expectation that there's going to be a run. And so why not get your money out? You don't get any return for keeping your money in a bank that's about to get um, pushed out of business due to liquidity reasons. And it's possible that's more of the circumstance for First Republic Bank, which was got a cash injection uh, last night. But the point being that what we're seeing in the U.S. banking system is a number of banks have some form of risk around either of those two factors or both, liquidity and uh, solvency. And so, and those banks, because of the nature of their deposits or because of the nature of their assets or of their regulation, found themselves in this problem. Now, what happens when there is a run on the bank in which regulators, the government, other big investors are willing, unwilling to stem the tide of a deposit run? We saw that in the, the beginnings of the Silicon Valley Bank unwind, in that they tried to sell some illiquid assets in what essentially was a fire sale. And they also tried to issue public equity to stem the tide of the runs, because what they need is money to pay back their depositors who are leaving. And the way to get money is you sell your assets or you issue new securities like equity or corporate debt. And so they tried both of those things and they failed. And so then they tried to merge, again, fire sale of the company. This is before the Fed stepped in, the FDIC stepped in, and that didn't happen either. So that continued to create the dynamics of a run in that depositors just had no reason to keep their money there. We'll come back to FDIC insurance, but it's important to know that a deposit is protected up to $250,000. 
And so if you have your money in a bank that's in, experiencing a run and you only have $250,000 or less in your account, now check your own circumstance. Um, this is a financial advice in that way, but you should be safe. And so you don't need to withdraw your money. But many people, corporations, people who are just downright lazy or they have lots of checks to pay, small businesses that have checks to pay, medium-sized businesses that have operating transactional accounts at banks have to keep more than $250,000 in those accounts, and it's not insured. And so they run. Anyone who has um, more than $250,000 should run if there is a liquidation slash solvency issue with the bank. And so that's what happened in Silicon Valley Bank. 97.5% of the deposits at Silicon Valley Bank were chunky and over $250,000. So their deposits looked very, very different to your local community bank, which is probably, you know, much higher percentage, maybe 60, 70% insured deposits. Um, and that makes a big difference. If your bank is 100% insured deposits, there's it's not going to get run. So that's an important future topic for the FDIC to deal with. And I'll mention it at the end of this conversation. So that was a pretty unique situation. And so what happened, they tried to do a fire sale liquidation of their assets or issue equity. And fire sales generally don't go well. So I want to say the most important thing to know is the thing, the steps that the Fed, by announcing its easing terms at the discount window and the new program called the BTFP, are programs designed for one thing and one thing only, to avoid a fire sale of assets, which harms the bank harms the depositors and harms the taxpayer because the taxpayer will have to may have to provide funds to the the bank to allow it to survive. And so those programs are designed to slow the fire sale and turn it into a managed sale over in the case of the BTFP about a year. Now, the one thing and this is getting into the weeds, but one very important thing thing about the BTFP is that the loan that the government makes to have the bank that is experiencing a run be able to pay off its depositor is collateralized by assets of the bank so that the U.S. taxpayer is has less risk to the potential of the bank failing. That collateral has to be eligible, and it, which means it has to be essentially government-backed, so either treasury bonds, notes and bills, or mortgages that are backed by the federal government. Agency mortgages are what they're called. Some banks don't have a lot of that, and that brings us to the First Republic case. The First Republic assets, so they were experiencing a run, and unable to, you know, the potential to meet their depositors' became, needs became critical. And the assets were not eligible for this new program because the bank, First Republic Bank, just doesn't buy a bunch of treasuries and mortgages like many do. It does real loans in the real economy to real people and businesses and uh, is very valuable to those debtors and the economy. But unfortunately, they still would have to fire sale all of those assets because they can't borrow against them in the government program. So what did the government do? It arranged all of the largest banks in a consortium to deposit money to the First Republic Bank. And so their deposits, were used to pay off the deposits of the people that were running. And there's a sign of confidence, and the government definitely cajoled, demanded, as they are it's the bank's regulators, to make this deposit. And the depositors, the banks that made these depositors, are at risk. 
because they're not insured, but they also have to judge whether a fire sale liquidation of the First Republic Bank is worth it or whether by depositing a significant amount of money, they can slow that liquidation of the assets and turn it into something other than a fire sale, but a more managed sale, which I think is the highest level point. The banks that are seeing these runs are either out of business in the case of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, or will never get these deposits back. And so they're going to have to shrink. And that means they're going to have to sell assets, sell, branch, sell physical assets, sell financial assets that they have on their balance sheet in order to shrink the company to recognize that they have less access to depositors going forward. And so that can be done in a fire sale way, or it can be done in a managed way. And basically, the two programs that I admit, that I mention, the government program of BTFP and the cajoling of the major banks to make deposits in banks in this bank, maybe they'd make it in other banks, we don't know yet, in this bank that just didn't have any eligible collateral to take advantage of the BTFP program slows the fire sale into a managed sale, but it doesn't stop the sale and delevering of these, these smaller banks that are experiencing the run. So how do we stop runs? And this will be the third potential government action, which is already being discussed in Congress, already being discussed in uh, the administration with the FDIC. And I expect the FDIC in the next two weeks, we'll have a proposal to change the $250,000 limit, uh, sorry, insurance on deposits to something more, and possibly with some nuances. Um, Bob Elliott, one of my colleagues from Bridgewater, and I discussed um, a variety of ways of doing this. I think I very strongly disagree with the idea of insuring all deposits with a across the entire banking system. I disagree with it because if they do, that means that deposits are riskless. And if they earn interest, and this is an important subtlety, if they earn a lot of interest and aren't penalized by getting that guarantee by some fee mechanism, um, that will significantly reduce the demand for other riskless assets like UST bills, municipal bonds, short-term municipal bonds short-term corporate bonds. And that will distort the place where people save in a way that is has fairly obvious consequences to who will bear the burden of this increased cost of raising money, the government, municipalities, and corporations, to the benefit of banks. The banks themselves will now have the stickiest of sticky deposits. And that, maybe not immediately, but one day, would encourage banks to take more risk. And if banks take more risk, that changes the way our financial system works and risks something like the 2007 crisis occurring again, not at the risk of depositors anymore, but at the risk of those who insure the deposits. <laughs> so remember, the FDIC can't insure the $18 billion, trillion dollars of deposits if we were ever to insure everything without a tremendous demand on the taxpayer. They only get little bits of insurance premiums from the banks that get the insurance. And so if the FDIC were to have to insure everybody, they couldn't deal with a catastrophic failure of our banking system. That's just not going to happen without the government having to borrow tremendous amounts of money to and print tremendous amounts of money. So Anyway, the point being that the FDIC will come up with some ideas, and hopefully, and as I said, we, I talked with Bob about this, we came up with an idea that transactional, corporate, small business, loan, and even large individual accounts that simply need to keep a lot of money because a lot of money goes in from revenues and, and a lot of money comes out in spending and salaries and so on large transactional accounts may be worthy of insuring because it's simply 
the way the world works when you have a business. You need a certain capacity of 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 cash flow. Um, but that shouldn't get interest. So it's possible that you could penalize transactional accounts in a way that would generate protection, but at a cost. So anyway, it'll be interesting to see what the FDIC does. And now stepping back and saying, we have these two programs. Well, the cajoling isn't a program. It's a, it's an arm twisting. Maybe they arm twist another bank other than First Republic Bank in the future. But the BTFP program is a legitimate program, and we'll see how many people take it up in order to slow the fire sale of a bank run. And we'll also see two weeks from now, if there aren't any bank failures, there's a fair chance that people are going to say, nah, I'll just keep my money in the bank. It's a pain to go to another bank. We'll see. Bank runs stop just because they slow, they stop happening. It's just the nature of human, the hum, is human nature that when, um, it's not on the front page anymore. People go back to their prior behavior, um, leaving too much money in uninsured accounts. Um, but all that, this is all happening very rapidly. So I want to step back and say the two big things, these ideas that we need to delay the shrinking of the balance sheets of banks that are um, losing deposits is probably a pretty good thing comms markets. It allows a delevering to happen in a controlled way. It has to happen because the deposits aren't going back to these big banks, these small banks. It's just, they're just not. Even with insurance, once you're gone, you're gone. You don't go back to the same bank. It just doesn't happen. So these banks are going to delever. Now let's talk about the other side. So the U.S. government lends, lends money to these small banks, these, these vulnerable banks, these banks that are losing deposits. It wants its money back in a year, so they better delever so that they can pay the government back. But the money they lend goes into the banking system in this way. First, it goes to the losing bank. The losing bank transfers that reserve to a big bank along with as the depositor moves their money from the small bank to the big bank so now that we can look at the let's put the losing bank aside we recognize they're never getting the deposit back and they're going to have to delever now let's look at the other side now you have this depositor who was just you know a normal joe who was keeping his money in a bank account for a reason he wasn't nothing's changed for him he's not gonna all of a sudden buy meme stocks because he moved his money from first republic bank to to chase he's just gonna use the checking account like he always has use the bank account like he always has keep it in a bank account so that's not going to be stimulative he's happy he didn't he didn't lose his money but he's not going to start buying assets just because now the bank the new bank the strong bank has a an asset, which is this bank reserve, um, which is basically money on deposit with the Fed, and a liability, which is the new deposit to the person who has a deposit. And so their balance sheet has grown. In normal environments, you can pretty much count on as balance sheets grow, risk grows in that a new deposit generally gets levered between 1.1 and 1.5 times over time. So you could think that these guys are going to, with the new deposit, the new asset and the new liability, they're going to create money and lever their balance sheet by either making a new loan because their balance sheet has grown and they can take on a, a new loan, which would create money and stimulate, or they might actually just create money and buy a U.S. Treasury bond. And that's where people discuss the, top, the idea of QE, that this is QE. These programs are QE, but that's the mechanism how it has to work. New bank has a new asset, and sorry, strong bank has a new asset and a new liability, and they decide to lever their balance sheet because of that. 
if that's what happens, yeah, this is going to be stimulative to financial assets and potentially the economy from that side. Now remember, the other side is the bank that is delevering. That's a reduction in um, the holding of assets or a reduction in their amount of loans they offer the real economy. Either physical loans are getting reduced or, or financial assets like treasuries and mortgages are getting reduced. So they're delevering. And that is, again, these are not the right labels, but that looks like QT, whereas this new bank, the, the strong bank is potentially levering. That looks like QE, I again, Neither This is neither of those things. It's just how money moves. QE is a, the Fed buying bonds. QT is the Fed selling bonds. Don't use the label for everything on the, on the planet. It only, it only belongs to those things. But it is important to know that if the bank that's receiving the new deposit is levering more, buying more financial assets, offering more loans than the delevering bank is reducing its loans and reducing its assets, then the economy gets stimulated. If on the other hand, we know these guys are delevering on the small side, what if the big side says, you know, before all this happened, my equity, my equity hasn't changed. Before it happened, my equity was the same. My After it happens, my equity is all the same. The only thing that's changed is my assets and liabilities have gone up. They say, you know, before all this happened, I had exactly what I wanted. I had the amount of leverage to my equity, meaning the amount of risk my equity was taking was what I wanted. And by the way, I have tremendous financial flexibility with my current balance sheet to lever up to buy my own shares, to pay di dividends, to buy mortgages, to issue loans, whatever I want, I could do. But they haven't. Well, or they've done what they've done. So there's no reason to believe that they would then willy-nilly lever up this balance sheet because the equity hasn't changed. What has changed is the size of the balance sheet. So if you lever it, you're going to, the equity, is going to experiencing more risk and nothing's really changed. So, you know, my weighing of the two factors, and that's what you have to do, is this is clearly a delevering sale of financial assets, um, reduction in credit creation by the small banks, and that's nowhere close to being offset by what the big banks will do with the money they are receiving. In fact, ironically, one of the things they've done is they've given it to one of the small banks as a deposit in the First Republic case. And that's not levering up. It's taking a boatload of credit risk, perhaps, but it isn't levering up in the traditional way in which it would then positively affect the economy. These guys don't need to lever up these big banks, and they could have if they wanted to anyway. And if you look at their balance sheets, you can see they've been selling treasuries and mortgages since QT was announced. They've been eliminating new loan creation since you know the economy has felt like it was struggling. And so they're not making new loans. They're not they're selling bonds. That seems like the opposite to levering up. And so these new deposits, to me, just aren't going to do anything. And so this money creation, and it was money creation. The Fed made a created money was received collateral to back that that money creation. And that money creation ended up at Chase's bank account. And so it is money creation. There's no doubt about it. Now, it's only temporary money creation. And, you know, you may believe it or not, but the money is due back in a, in a year and is likely to get paid through the delevering of these balance sheets. But it was money creation. And so, yeah, you could be concerned that money creation is going to create risky behaviors. But you know, it's up to you to make that judgment. So then we come back to how does this all play out? And so I'm waiting for the FDIC to see how much deposits are going to be insured. And that'll have an implication. And, you know, I'll come back to you guys when that implication is more clear. And by and large, it'll have consequences. But what it should do is slow the run. 
and slow any fire sale of assets, but probably unless it's very well and politically crafted to favor, to subsidize regional banks, rural banks, community banks, which is certainly a possibility that it is politically designed to favor those banks. It's unlikely that the delevering of some of these bank these banks is going to be eliminated. In fact, the Fed is going to probably look at the SIVB situation and see that they ran a very aggressive risk book and change regulations. And that will limit what risks these banks take, which is mostly duration risk. And if they limit duration risk, there'll be some overhang of banks that are still long, unhedged assets. So I expect that type of regulation to come in hand with the FDIC reg regulation. And it's a complex thing. But at the end of the day, these banks will, the solvent ones will stay around with a different deposit base than they've had. And they'll have to adjust their risk based on regulation and business. And they'll pay back their loans. First Republic, if it survives, will have to return its deposits in 120 days. That's their fire sale calendar ticking. They've got to get out of enough to pay back these depositors, which is $30 billion in 120 days. So there's a pretty big overhang with them. And of course, it could be rolled and cajoled again, and we don't know, and I'm not making any predictions on that. But the whole idea is all this is about banks that need to change their balance sheet in a fundamental way to address the new reality, with in, including regulation, FDIC changes, and you know social changes in order to survive. And that process will is no longer a fire sale. And I think that's probably a good thing. We'll see how it plays out. At this point, the biggest message is I expect this whole event starting before any of this happened two weeks ago <laughs> to be, have the following impact assets are for sale to delever these banks that are not likely to result in levering of the banks that receive the deposits um, through that money creation channel and the money creation will be removed from the system relatively quickly as the crisis ends and the delevering occurs and so the reduction of credit creation in the, the clients that are served by these banks without an offsetting credit creation from the banks that are receiving the new deposits is a tightening of financial conditions and is going to slow the economy, going to slow the, and going to have an impact on inflation. And you know, those are the outcomes that we we'll see as it relates to financial assets. You know, it's a the whole thing in entirety is a net negative for financial assets because of the weighing of the delevering of the financial of the smaller banks without an offsetting levering by the bigger banks. Now that could change and it's worth looking at, but that's my synthesis. I hope this was helpful. Have a great day.